we come now to the last hour for this evening. And, uh, you know, you, uh, the Bible talks about uh, saving the good wine for last. Amen. The vintage wine for last. And we have a, a power-packed speaker. And we are so happy that you have chosen to stay by here in our audience in Thompsonville and our world audience. Now, before I introduce the speaker, I need to ask a very special personal favor from you. I have invited my neighbors to come and be with us on tomorrow evening. My neighbors to the right and my neighbors to the left. And they have consented to do so. But I want you to pray. The neighbors on the right are the Rogers and the neighbors on the left are the Newells. The Rogers, uh, the wife of my neighbor, her father is a pastor of the local church around the corner. And he has consented to come also. And so I don't want the devil to get in. I want them to come and feel the spirit of God in this place. So would you pray with me for the Rogers and the Newells that nothing will hinder them from coming on tomorrow evening? That is very, very special to me. I do not know when I first met C.D. Brooks. It seems as though I've always known him. I guess there was a time when I did not. But I don't know when that time was. When I was in college, he was preaching... Uh, even then powerfully for the breath of life. There was a sermon that he preached called Rendezvous at Beth Peor. And all of the senior theology majors were preaching Rendezvous at Beth Peor. We preached it in the mirrors, in our bathrooms. We watched his gestures and we tried to emulate his gestures. Everybody wanted to be C.D. Brooks. And you were really good if you had a C in your name. And I strutted around Oakwood College because I was C.A. Murray. And people who didn't have C's invented C's because everybody wanted to have a, a C. There was C.E. Bradford and C.D. Brooks and C.B. Rock and, and, and uh, uh, just C's everywhere. So if you had a C in your name, you were, you were destined for greatness. But Elder Brooks and Elder Walter Artes began a ministry so many years ago. There are at least 13 churches in and across the world that carry the name Breath of Life that were, as we used to say, preached out by C.D. Brooks. God used him so many years in so many ways at the Breath of Life. The thing that touches me about this man of God is his humility. When you meet him, you know he's a genuine child of God who has been used greatly by God but who retains a humility that is refreshing, humbling, and enduring. And endearing. He travels with his wife. I know Walterine is here. I don't see her, but I know she's in the audience. She's never far from his side. And we are both pleased and blessed to have this man of God to come to be with us uh, this, I think, is his third year, um, and as long as he wants to come, Jim has said there's a place for him, because there's always a place for a man of God who preaches the plain, simple word of God and has been used by God for so many, many years. He is speaking on the topic, growing in Jesus, growing in Christ, a very timely topic, and I am sure that God will use him in a very special way to touch our hearts as we give ear to the man of God who will be preaching the word of God. Before he comes, there's a favorite song of mine that um, bespeaks a walk with Jesus. We, we love Christ because he does so very much for us. It's no wonder that we love him. When we think of all the things Jesus has done for us, could we help but love our Savior? When I think how Jesus loved me How he waited patiently Even when I turned my back and walked away When he knew I wanted everything This world could offer me 
Then I guess he knew the price I'd have to pay. So he watched me stumble downward, saw each compromise I made, heard each lie I whispered just to get my way. Still he waited there to hear me when I cried to him and prayed. Then he saved my soul, and that is why I say, tell me, is it any wonder that I love him when you consider all he's done for me? And is it any wonder that I long to do his will? And let his light shine out for all to see. And is it any wonder that I praise him each time I think of how he's made me free? And is it any wonder? that I've given him my heart when Jesus freely gave his life for me. When I think how Jesus loves me, how he watches patiently, how his arms are stretched to meet me when I run. When I'm feeling down and lonely, how he's there to comfort me. In the darkness, he becomes my morning sun. When I think of how he's healed me, how he's touched me in my pain, how his gentle hands have wiped my tears away, how he's taken every heartache and brought happiness again. Oh, I want the world to hear me when I say, Tell me, is it any wonder that I love him? Each time I think of how he's made me free. And is it any wonder that I long to do his will and let his light shine out for all to see? And is it any wonder that I praise him? Each time I think of how he's made me free. And is it any wonder that I've given him my heart when Jesus freely gave his life for me. I feel greatly blessed to come back again to this miracle place where everybody is so nice to me. <laughs> My wife and I are glad to be here, and we appreciate the invitation to join in this year's spring camp meeting. May God bless you. Would you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, 
we ask for help because we are always desperate. We always need Thee. Be our God and use this final segment to Thy glory. We humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to be loyal to my assignment, and I think I can, while at the same time switching topics a little bit, or titles. I want to speak on the title, under the title, God and Angels Amazed. But first, welcome to section D. I don't know where I got this or when, but it came to my mind. Section D, depression, decline, depravity, doom, denial, decay, debacle, dementia, debt, deconstruction, dissipation, distrust, drugs, dilly-dallying, despair, devolution, danger, dysfunction, degradation, divisiveness, deprivation, deficiency, dilemma, damnation, death, and darkness. Welcome to Section D. Since I met with you last, the world remains an unfriendly place. If we're not getting tired of it now, and longing for another place, there's something wrong with us. I was reading again from the Psalms, excuse me, from Isaiah chapter 59, and these words, beginning with verse 10. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far off from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street. And equity cannot enter, yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him, and there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. We have read these solemn accusations even against the people of God. And when we come to verse 16, the Bible says, He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. God and angels amazed. Ellen White says, Angels wonder that there's so little prayer coming from those in such desperate need. 
Angels are amazed. God is amazed. The infinite heart of God throbs for men in their desperation. God wants to hear from us. And there will be no growth and no development in Christ Jesus until we learn how to pray extraordinary prayers. And that's what I wanted to talk about. God wants to hear from us. The Lord's servant says, there will be no revival without prayer. He who kneels before God can stand before any man. As a matter of fact, a lot of kneeling will keep you in good standing rode down the street and saw a sign on a church lot. It said, our church is prayer conditioned. Yeah. That's what God wants from us. That's his will for us. God wants to bail us out, to rescue us from the mess that we're in. But he can't reach us unless we're willing to talk to him and develop a relationship with Him. He said, in all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Look what He's offering if we will just acknowledge Him. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, the Bible says. Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. And whatsoever you ask believing will be granted. God pledges that. He is a merciful God. He wants to be amongst us. He wants to do extraordinary things with his remnant church. He does not want business as usual. God wants us to get something going that will finish the work under his direction and power, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And in case you wanted another touch, Isaiah says, as one whom his mother comforteth. There is no comfort quite like that of a mother. I remember once uh, romping through the forest and stirred up a whole nest of hornets. And they took it out on me. I was running and screaming and fighting, it seemed, for naught. And my mother heard me coming. It seemed that when she shut the screen door, she shut all of them out and all of me in. And then she began the ministration to relieve my pain and to encourage me and to make me feel that big boys don't cry as one whom his mother comforteth. All of this, and yet heaven seems to be incredulous. Where are the praying saints? There's lots of complaining, lots of blaming others, a lot of questioning, a lot of theologizing and philosophizing, all these things we hear all the time, but where are the prayers? Ellen White makes uh, an unusual statement. She suggests that praying three times a day is not enough. Now, Daniel was a man of power. He prayed three times a day. There's a song about it. But you have to believe, as I believe, that Daniel prayed a lot more than that. These were formal prayers with the windows open. These were witnessing prayers. But Daniel stayed in an attitude of prayer all the time. And the Lord's servant says, we've got to come to that. And she uses a word that I want to use here tonight. We've got to learn to agonize in prayer. We've got to go to our knees and stay there until a change comes. Got to stay there until something happens. 
And God is powerful enough to make it happen. He loves us enough to make it happen. Some of us are tired of our old selves. God wants to make a change. Ellen White says there's some things God knows to do, but will not do it until we ask. You see this business of praying and God blessing, this is a relationship, an interchange. You and God, you and God, you as an individual talking to a wonderful God. The King James Version uses the word wondered. God wondered that there was no intercessor. I read some other authorities on this, and they said that word is too weak to convey the Hebrew meaning. And they suggest it comes closer to saying God was desolate, wanting to hear from us. Another one says he was astonished that we were not praying. Section D, all of that we live with day by day. God is astonished that we can see crime and evil on every hand and not cry out in prayer more and more and more. We've got to agonize in prayer. And if we're willing to do it, God is willing to assure us, I am not dead. I am alive, and I'm ready, and heaven is open for business. If you will simply come to me in prayer, I've got some answers that you are in desperate need of. I will confirm the truth in your heart. I will rise up, but I'm waiting on you to ask. I see amazing things happening amongst us. I've been around a long time. My birthday came on Sabbath last year. And I saw my grandson slipping into my church. He goes to another. And I wondered, what's he doing here? But then I thought, oh, they're going to my house for dinner, so that's it. <laughs> but that wasn't it. At a certain point, he got up and walked to the rostrum. It was prearranged. He thanked those for giving him an opportunity to say something. And then he said, we have an unusual thing happening in our family this week. My grandmother's birthday was Thursday. My uncle's birthday is the next day, Friday. And today is my granddaddy's birthday, and he is 80 years old. I wasn't ready for that to be general knowledge. <laughs> but the secret is out now. God's been good to me, and I've seen things move from this to that, and some of the moves are not always encouraging. God allowed me to do evangelism for a lot of years, and when we ran these big campaigns in these various cities, the objections came from men out there somewhere. Today, objections are coming from within. We've got people who seem determined to change our message. They want it to suit them. I found something in my Bible. If I can find it, I'll show it to you. It's something. I, it's been in there a long time. You can't see it, but at least you know I have it. I, I copied it from the Associated Press. And it says that they found a pig in Indonesia that is like a pig anywhere else except this pig chews its good. And it is said that a certain famous rabbi in Los Angeles pronounced it kosher. <laughs> and others said the same thing. It can be included in the Jewish diet. And I thought to myself, how like us that is. We want a pig that chews the could. We're looking for something easier. Well, it's not going to get easier. And in case you don't know, 
I want to explain to you the dragon. Revelation 12, 17, verse 9 tells you who that is. The dragon was wroth with the church and went to make war. Went to make what? With the remnant of her seed. Who are they? They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. What's that? Revelation 19.10. It is the gift of prophecy or the spirit of prophecy. We are at war. And there is a terrible enemy who despises every loving one of you. And God knows that. And he can do you harm. If you drop your guard. So God is amazed that you don't pray. That you don't ask for angelic protection. That you don't resist the devil. For he trembles when the weakest saint is on his knees. That's you. That's me. You don't have to be some high professional. The weakest saint. We are told that before the end of time, thousands would join the church and be baptized in a day. And I'm afraid some of us in this country and Europe and other places figured that has to pertain to us. I want to tell you it's already happening. And it's happening among people who can't even read. They hear the Word of God. They do not object to the standards. They are glad to hear these wonderful things that set them free. Reminds me of when I was a 10-year-old child in a Sabbath-keeping home. But we didn't know any better. We just, we just did what the Lord said, and he didn't tell us how to do it. And mother, on Friday evening, would be baking long after sunset. We didn't know, but we finally found the church. 1940, I was 10 years old. And we went into the church for the first time. And it was as though God spoke to me and said, this is it. And I haven't changed my mind in 70 years. Yeah. I want to tell you something else. When we as a large family heard the standards of the church, the standards of God's Word, they didn't turn us off. They turned us on. We thought, my, we are joining something special. What is this that all of a sudden we want to adjust and change and, and, and redo? It's as though we think God made a mistake when he did it the first time. And so now we're saying, all right, Lord, let, let's see if we can't get you straightened out and get this thing together. God says, no. And as a matter of fact, in verse 1 of this chapter I was reading, he said, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. He's still the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He can still do as he pleases. He's waiting on us so that we can get something done. And he promises no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. My sword is the breath of my mouth. My heart is set on advancing you, moving you up, making room for others who will come in. Now, it is true that those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten, and I do it for the development of your character. We try to get this point across. Nothing that God allows to happen to you is against you, only for you. I don't care how rotten it is. One of the easiest texts to talk about and hardest to put into practice is Romans 8. All things. How many things? All, All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. You got to believe it. And you got to really believe it. And you got to believe it even more. Ellen White says that God's hand amongst his people left the mark of prosperity. He still does that. He takes better care of us than our complaining hearts are willing to admit. God knows who he is. Do you know who you are? Do I know who I am? God is saying to us, I cannot be held up 
nor held back. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. They are thoughts of peace. I have your best interest at heart. And if I don't treat you exactly as I do this man over here, it's because you don't need the same treatment he needs. I know what I'm doing. And if you and I could get into a conversation, it would become clear even to you. There used to be an old man, a great evangelist, by the name of J.G. Thomas. I don't know if anybody can remember him, but when I was just a youngster in ministry, he was a man of great power. He was already 82 years old when I called him to do a revival at my church. And then after breakfast, we'd go down by the lake, and I would sit at his feet and learn and learn and absorb and absorb. Now, he was a man who had only gone to school through the fifth grade. And we talked about it. I said, but your English is perfect. And this and that and the other, these are things that you find amongst polished men. How did you acquire this with a fifth grade education? He said, aha. <laughs> the Lord said, if we would offer him a perfect heart, he would show himself strong in our behalf. He said, and I believe God. And he did it. He did it. He stood in my pulpit like a 20-year-old ramrod street and preached with power. He rests in Jesus now. But I will never forget him. You can't bother God. He said, I will never weary of listening to you. You might even pray the same prayer over and over and over. Don't think that I'm hard and not listening. I am listening. I want you to keep on saying it until you mean it. I will not weary. Clad with zeal, ready and eager to advance the welfare of his children, God is often immediately responsive. Did you hear what I said? Immediately responsive baptized a fine gentleman and his entire family when I was in New Jersey. He drove a big, heavy truck for a living. And after he was converted, you're talking about a man who loved the truth and loved the church. But he would leave home before sun came out every morning with that big truck. And as he rolled along the highways that were not yet filled with traffic, he loved to sing. He sang in church. And he was good at it. And on this particular morning, he is going down the road, perhaps a little too fast, and he's singing to the glory of God when all of a sudden that great big vehicle went into a spin. There was ice on this curve and a steep drop into a ravine. And he thought he had had it. He, he called me chief. He said, chief, I cried out, Lord. He said, that's all I had time to say. I said, man, that's enough. That's enough. He's up there. Heaven is open for business 24 and 7. And when you said, Lord, he connected that to what you've been saying all the other times. He didn't have time to wait on you to finish a prayer. You remember when Peter was sinking, trying to walk on water? He said, Lord, save me. What a short prayer. It worked. If Peter had prayed like some of us, he would have drowned before he could say Amen. And so he cried, Lord, and the truck actually ran off the road and tilted. But he called me chief. He said, chief, you know, there was an old tree standing there, and it was dead. God using a dead tree. And he said that truck just sort of leaned over against that tree and came to its rest. And I climbed out the other side, and when help finally got there, we got out of there, and the truck wasn't even damaged. I want you to know, and I could tell all kinds of experiences that I have had. God can answer immediately. Amen. If he waits a while, that's his business. Amen. We have to keep on talking to him. He wondered. He was desperate. 
that there were no intercessors. People were politicking. They were all stirred up. They were active. They were busy. But God and angels wonder why there are so few real prayers coming in. I find an objection to standards of the church. Do they bother you? Now, I don't think the church ought to make up standards just to make life dull for young people. I don't believe in that. But before you cast it out, you'd better consider whether God said it or a committee. <laughs> you might have some leeway with a committee, but you be careful how you start moving God's ideas around. For well, some, the church is too old-fashioned. Uh, somebody told me that one day. He said, you're an old-fashioned preacher. I said, it doesn't bother me at all. God's old-fashioned. He was, he is, he shall be. <laughs> Been around a long time. I'm in good company if I'm old-fashioned. <laughs> not only that, he says, I am the Lord. I change not. God does not create a dichotomy between the modernists and the conservatives. That's something we do. We look at people with gray hair and figure that they're old-fashioned. Don't need to listen to them. Now, I don't take it personally, but uh, I don't see it the same way. In Malachi, the Lord tells us that the day of Elijah will come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And when Elijah comes, he, you know what that means. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and children to the fathers. The Holy Spirit doesn't divide us. He brings us together. I heard a powerful message tonight on unity. That's what the Lord does. And that's what he wants to do. And really, it's what he is going to do. The Bible says the enemy comes in like a flood. Then the Lord will lift up a standard against him. You've got to have something that anchors your soul. You know, the devil will get you into retreat, and you're going backward somewhere before you crash on the shore. There ought to be a rock to which you fasten your bark and past which you will not retreat. God gives you answers from the Word of God. And when the devil comes in like a flood, you hold him up, and he'll stop dead in his tracks. Amen. He planned on a mighty onslaught. He turned all of his big guns on a small target. Wicked! Look how he treated Jesus. He's no friend. Sometimes he'll pat you on the back and make you think he is, but he's no fr You know what Ellen White says? The demons that were cast out of heaven with Satan don't even like each other. <laughs> and yet we think we can befriend them and hang out with them. Not on your life. Worldliness will come in like a flood. I, I want to use this metaphor a little bit. Like a flood television. Now, I'm not against television. 3ABN would be good for nothing without television. Is that clear? And I felt the same way about Breath of Life and all the other entities that are now carrying the truth 24 and 7 to all the world. But there's something attached to a television or unattached. It's got a little button, and you're supposed to know how to work that. And there are things you can't look at in good and regular standing, for Satan has harnessed the industry, and he sends his temptations by the minute over television to reach the corresponding chords of our fallen nature. And then we get to the place we feel compelled to go along, and our minds begin to change, change about modesty. There's a word, they. This is what they are wearing. It's not a question of whether a Christian ought to. It's what are 
they doing? You know what? Only those who live up to the light they have will receive the latter rain, says the Spirit of Prophecy. Are you weak and sinful? Oh, by the way, there's another one. Ellen White says the standards of the church are for spiritual people only. You know, whirling standards don't make sense. You don't want to hear them. But the question is, are you weak and sinful? Many of us are. And yet there are many who are really conscientious. They desire to live for Jesus. They want to be His. He will lead them to eternal life. But the enemy runs up with his suggestions and makes them see their own faults. He makes them dwell on their own weaknesses. I quote the Lord's servant, we should not dwell on and indulge anxiety and fear whether we will be saved or not. Commit the keeping of your soul to Christ and trust him. Devil got many wondering, can you make it? And we become consumed with that. We're not supposed to do that. We're disturbed over uh, the contending forces that want to control our very souls. And that will cause us to focus on them and stop praying as we ought. And the world today is given to reveling to the spot party spirit. The world today wants to have fun. A three-letter word that I'm beginning to have a problem with. We want everything to be fun. What we really mean is we want an easy road. We want to be able to go to heaven. Oh, don't let us miss that. But we want to do it on our own terms. We want to do it while not giving up anything in particular. We want to do it without sacrifice. We want to go to heaven while doing as we please. And so active amongst us today are debates over the morality of movies. A lady approached me one day and she wanted to discuss Harry Potter versus Mother Goose <laughs> in teaching children to read. You're wasting your time talking to people sometimes. Satan and his imps come in like gangbusters. He's not kidding. Satan is dead serious. Every one of us that he can get to bear his own sins makes it lighter on him in the final judgment of the devil himself. He has great wrath, and he will blow you away. But I thank God he will be confronted when you love the Lord and your prayers are ascending and Satan makes a beeline towards you, angels are on the wing. He will be confronted. He can be defeated by Bible study, by prayer. I told you three times a day, not enough. You got to agonize, Ellen White says. And sermons, sermons are meant to buck us up, not compromise. Who are we kidding? Sermons without substance and above everything else, examples. We have a right to expect to see examples in the church and to be taught, taught by parents while we are yet small and taught in a way that it will not leave us. Now, in case we don't remember it, the entire world wants to hear the Word of God. They don't even know they want to hear it, but they do because it's the only thing that satisfies. The world is wanting to hear the Word of God. Baptized a man in a big effort in Chicago. That man would come every night, but he'd sneak away as soon as we were ready to offer prayer. Obviously, he lived very well. He had a luxury car, and he had an outfit the same color the jacket and the pants, and his wife was elegant. It was just everything, and I could never get to him because I'm busy shaking hands with all the other folk. And one night he showed up waiting for me. 
And he said, Pastor, I need to ask you a question. He said, I got a lot of good liquor in my house. And if I join your church, what shall I do with it? I said, well, first of all, you're laboring under misapprehension. There's no such thing as good liquor. What, what you mean is you've got expensive liquor. Now, you won't know what to do with it. First of all, if you give it away and the man goes out and has a wreck and kills himself, that's written down in heaven against your name. Same thing if you sell it. The Bible says, woe unto him that gives his neighbor drink. He said, then what will I do with it? I said, I don't think I'll tell you what to do. Let me tell you what I'd do. I'd go into my bathroom and declare it a chapel. <laughs> I'd bow down before the toilet and declare it an altar. <laughs> and I would start talking to God about my intentions how serious I was, and I would start uncorking and unscrewing, and I'd turn them up and let them gurgle out into the toilet. And when I finished, I'd thank God that I was finished forever. To my surprise, he almost snapped his finger. He said, if you had said anything else, I was walking away from here never to come back. Oh, when he died, he was the first elder of the church. You're not playing games. This is heaven or hell. Oh, there's something else that people want to hear. They want to hear voices from outer space. <laughs> They're listening all over the world, trying to hear voices from outer space. The other day, a fine lady who had been shot said goodbye to her husband, and he took off into space. The shuttle was making its last flight. On board was a $2 billion instrument, $2 billion. And it would be fastened to the space station. And the scientists back on Earth are hoping that that $2 billion nothing will give them clues as to how the universe began. <laughs> give me one red penny and I'll tell you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They want to hear voices from outer space. Well, I got voices from outer space. When I read the Word of God to men and women who are languishing in sin today, they are listening. They are listening to words from the land of pure delight. When I open my Bible, they are going to hear words from Beulah land. Words from outer space. Nobody down here could produce what I read from day after day after day and what I preach from. Every time I get up, all oh, my preaching isn't worth a dime. I got a message from a land where Storm winds are called zephyrs somewhere out there in outer space where the tree of life is, where the leaves of the tree hang over the wall. And Ellen White says you can pluck them now. They are for the healing of the nation. Just like that man I baptized with a liquor, he got healed and hated what he once loved. And Ellen White, in her writings, let me say it as boldly as I can, this is God giving us inside information. You can't get it anywhere else. And it is written in the testimonies that they are given to guide us through the time of trouble. Now, when I was reading to you a while ago, it says we grow as though we have no eyes. In ancient times, prophets were called seers. They could see what ordinary folk couldn't see. We have a prophetess. How on earth could God supply all the various epochs of his people with a prophet? And we come down to the most important thing, the climax of the gospel, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's no prophetic voice for us. Yes, there is. Yes. But we, some of us think it's smart not to pay attention. 
young college girl walked up to me and said, Pastor, here are some questions, and I want Bible answers. I don't want to hear anything Ellen White has to say. I said, well, that attitude assumes that Ellen White is unbiblical. Now, if that's true, you bring yours, I'll bring mine. Let's start a fire. And invite everybody with a spirit of prophecy book, pile it on. We'll burn them up, mine and yours, to start the fire. But before you start that fire, you better search the Scriptures and see if God promised such a gift to his people. Oh, thank the Lord. Surely he'll do nothing, but he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. God wants to hear from us. Not complaints and fightings, but to hear from us. And he will give us answers inside information. I spoke about God answering prayers immediately. A man at the John Conference was sitting on a big plane headed home. And as he was headed home, suddenly he heard a racket and all the loose papers began to fly up and the top of the plane just peeled off. Now that's, that's dying time. <laughs> they were told quickly how to take positions and get up. And he said as his head was bent over, he remembered his, his phone was in his pocket, so he called his wife to say goodbye. And when it didn't explode and and finally, the paper stopped flying around. It had depressurized. He decided to call her back and tell her how much he loved her. <laughs> they interviewed him on national television. And then subsequently, another plane had a part of it rip aside. And they came back to interview him again at the John Conference. God answers prayer right now. Yeah. Now, I don't know who else was on that plane, but I know that that man was praying. Yet God is shocked that the remnant church with such a heavy responsibility is not praying as it ought. In the Congress of the United States, they have a very important committee called the Ways and Means Committee. They make great decisions. They determine how your money will be spent. Well, I want to tell you God has Ways and Means Committees made up of angels. The Holy Ghost is the chairman. And when the devil comes in like a flood, Back to that metaphor again. These angels lift up a standard against him. Now, if you don't have that standard, you need to understand that a flood is violent. You need to understand that a flood will sweep away what it took wealth and time to acquire. You will understand that a flood takes homes, mansions in Malibu, little cabins somewhere else. Floods don't care. They strip away the topsoil, producing stony ground where the Word cannot take root, where gullies and debris linger. And there are some who grieve away the Holy Spirit and the Lord's servant says, after they've done it, they are left in a careless attitude, thinking they are in the fair way to heaven, but they are already lost. When the enemy comes in like a flood, he ravages and he desolates. A flood, a flood is noisy too, and we have to remember that. A flood is noisy. The devil comes in like a flood, and we get a lot of noise that doesn't amount to anything. A flood is an equal opportunity destroyer. The educated and the limited, the rich and the poor, he doesn't care. When the flood comes in, he destroys and ruins and takes away everything that is beautiful. Jehoshaphat was praying when he saw himself in a dilemma and knew no answer for. He said, oh, Lord, we don't have the might to face this enemy, nor do we know what to do. Now, I, I remember reading that a long time ago, and I thought, here's the king, and if he is disheartened, how in the world can he inspire anybody? But he did. He said, Lord, we don't have the might to face these folk, nor do we know how to do it. So we are turning to you. Amen. Oh, my. What a decision he had made. Lo, we turn to you. God is not overwhelmed by our emergencies. 
God has advantages that he can use. God can blink his eyes and, and people are moved out of their places and annihilated. God knows how to answer our prayers and he's willing to do it. He just can't understand why we don't pray more. We're going to become a conspicuous church. Did you hear what I said? We're coming to the point where we will be the focal issue. The whole world will pay attention. And many will make a last minute decision then when the doors of probation have already closed for the rest of us. It's coming. The church will be conspicuous. How could it be and not face problems and not face the assault of the devil when he is at war with us? I remember Dr. Chin's book, A New Look at God. He talked about a machine they had to measure emotions and things. And there was this woman who was very sick, but she was a good Christian. And as she was going under the anesthesia, that woman began to pray. And instead of falling to the negative side, Dr. Chin says the needle swung over to the positive side. Something's going on. That prayer is getting out yonder, past the skies, past the planets, past the galaxy, to be anchored in the throne room of God. God is shocked that we don't pray more. 